Coming up, John Brancato joins Ileana in just a minute. Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussion, news, and interviews. Popcorn Talk, we talk movies. And now, it's the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast, starring Ileana Douglas. Eavesdrop with Ileana as she interviews Hollywood's most prominent players about filmmaking, acting, and what really happens on the set of your favorite flicks and TV shows. Hi, everyone. It's Ileana Douglas. Welcome to the I Blame Dennis Hopper podcast. I'm so glad you tuned in. We are live today with John Brancato. John Brancato. Uh, Brancato. When he told me how to pronounce his name, he said it with a very Italian accent, so I thought I'd try it in the intro. Uh, people don't know this, but I'm uh, I'm a huge thriller fan. Mm. Uh, John Frankenheimer movies, of course, Manchurian Candidate, amazing film. Yeah. Uh, Parallax View. Three Days of the Condor. Oh, oh my goodness. Um, but, uh, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Uh, two things. One that I want to talk about is uh, Robert Redford retiring. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I'm so sad. I'm so sad. How, ha- how old a man is he? I'm know? not sure, but um, I'm going to be doing something upcoming. I'm doing actually a couple things upcoming. Yes. With Turner Classic Movies. Yay. And I just want to say one thing, just in terms of, uh, you know, I have been in the news lately. and uh, He's 81 uh, now. He's going to be 82 next week. Well, he's he's an incredible activist, and I'm going to have a really nice opportunity with a couple things I'm doing upcoming with... Uh, Turner Classic Movies, talking about some films of my grandfather's, a couple other things that is coming down the pipeline. And I just want to uh, thank Turner Classic Movies for being uh, extraordinary. And they are an amazing place uh, to uh, to work for and uh, incredibly supportive. I love them very much. Movies are, you know, have always saved me. So it's been great to work at Turner and Classic Movies. One other place I want to thank yeah. is a fantastic company called The Shout Factory that I'm also working with. And uh, if you're a fan of mine, why don't you go uh, download uh, Fil- Filmstruck, which is great, or go to uh, Shout Factory and buy a couple things from Shout Factory. They are a fantastic uh, company. So there's that. TCM yes. is such a perfect place for you to be. I mean, I love it, TCM. It, there's the synergy between what they do and what you do. It's it's it really is like you've been made for each other. Well, let me tell you something. TCM says you're when they say you're part of the TCM family, it's not a, a catchphrase. They really mean it. Mm-hmm. They are uh, they have just been an incredible. I I first started working with them as I talk about in 2012. Uh, through Robert Osborne and through talking about my my book and you know they every person who works there you know simply cares about uh, films mm-hmm. and uh, it's just an incredible you know that's all we want to do is talk about films but the people behind you know of course er- everybody who works there you know Ben Mankiewicz and Eddie Muller and the people behind the scenes Alicia Malone uh, Dave Carter every single person who works at, at TCM. We just it is a, it is like a wonderful camp, and uh, everybody supports each other, and it's just a great you know it's a great place to uh, to be involved with. I can't wait till you can talk about what you're doing coming up with them because it's again perfectly suited for you, but you can't talk about it right now. No, no, not it's not but I, I, here's a hint: it had something to do with movies. <gasps> <laughs> you heard it here first, folks. <laughs> okay, let's bring in John. <laughs> let's uh, do it, Brancato. Brancato. Who is perhaps best known as the writer of The Game, which is an incredible film starring Michael Douglas, and The Net. I love that movie, too, uh, starring uh, Sandra Bullock. He also wrote Terminator 3, Rise of the Machine. And uh, please welcome John Brancato. Thank you so much for being on the show. Well, thank you for being interested enough to have me. I'm are amazed. you kidding? We have a lot of, you know, I, I'm always complimented because we are, we are writer heavy on the show. I love talking to writers and, uh, you know, finding out how they, how they write. Because I feel, I always say to people, oh, you have a book, you have a book in you, you know, and I, I think everybody, I think that writing is very healing. I know that, you know, me writing the, my first book and I'm working on my second book right now. Um, I find it incredibly healing. So I think everybody should write a book, whether it gets published or not. Just give it to your family. Just go here. You see what you did to me? I hope screenplays <laughs> count. They do. They completely. <laughs> okay. They completely. I mean, we're going to get to your uh, some uh, 
a couple of your great movies. But, of course, I must ask you, what is the... Do you remember the first movie you saw and who took you to see it? Does it count if it's something I saw on television? Or totally, is that, is that yeah. unfair? Totally. Because there's a... Yeah. I remember when The Wizard of Oz used to be on television once a year. Yes. And I think it was around Easter time, mm -hmm. possibly. And I remember I was a really little kid, and my parents would sit me in front of it. Mm -hmm. I think it probably happened when I was three that they did that. And then it was a year later, and I was really kind of dreading it. The Wizard of Oz terrified me. Mm. And they sat me down in front of the television thinking it was going to make me really happy. They left the room, and it was like we used to have our television in the sunroom of our house, which was next to the mudroom of our suburban home. And it was a little black and white television. It was a kind with that heavy chunk of glass over the screen. Mm -hmm. And so there I was, and I was kind of dreading it. I was still having nightmares about the Wizard of Oz. Everything about it scared me. But I was too small to really inject. So I was, I was four, and I knew the flying monkeys were coming. I knew the <laughs> flying monkeys were coming. And I got up. I went into the mudroom. I got out my dad's a screwdriver from my dad's toolbox, uh -huh. which he had in there, and I attacked the television when the flying monkeys came on. I actually went at it with the screwdriver and cracked the glass wow. that covered the screen. Luckily, it wasn't just the screen or it would have exploded. Um, they heard, because I was screaming <laughs> as I was doing it, attacking the television, and I think my parents must have thought, we have Satan in the house. <laughs> this is like, is there any greater sacrilege than trying to kill the television in an American get, suburban household? That's the first time I've ever heard that. And when you see it as an, an adult, do, do those emotions still like... I remember them. Yeah, the flying monkeys are still pretty creepy to me. Yes. They really are. Everything <laughs> about them. And the makeup, the horrible little costumes. I mean, yeah. animals in costume are always disturbing anyway. And yeah. Just, and it's enough that we're all just monkeys, too. So <laughs> the, all of it was bad. So that's I, my memory of, of, of probably my earliest movie memory. Um, as far as actual movie theater mm -hmm. movies, I right. mean, I remember I was taken to see... Um, Mary Poppins uh -huh. by my mom. And that was like the first time I was ever in a movie theater. Yeah. It's probably like four or five. Maybe as an antidote to, mm -hmm. to my experience with... Another Richard flying. Oz. Another flying uh, sequence. And I loved it. And I wanted <laughs> and to see it again. animals in costumes. Animals in costumes. Got all of it. And I wanted to see it again, but they wouldn't take me again. And I remember like uh, begging and begging. It must have been really annoying. Yeah. And I only got to go once. I asked for the soundtrack album. They wouldn't buy it for me. Aww. It was a tragic Aww. childhood. Yeah, it's so interesting in those days because uh, that's why I always ask like who you went to see it with because a lot of the movies I saw were, were with my uh, Italian grandmother. And so that obviously those are the certain type of movies that we saw, usually musicals at Radio City. Mm hmm and then, you know, my parents would take me to these art movies, and I didn't understand what was happening. I always talk about uh, the, they took me to see The Servant, you know, which was this okay. Dirk Bogard kind of, you know, weird. Uh, little film, as I remember. Yeah, Joseph Losey. You were very really screwed me up, but, you know. So they would take me to see art movies. But so, did your parents take you to see? It was is popular films or almost never would they take me to films. Um, my parents were much older; they mm -hmm. had two kids, and then I was kind of the accident that they thought about aborting. Oh no! Many years later, and so it's like <laughs> late in life, baby. My mom, I think, was probably on the verge of menopause. So then, all of a sudden, here I come, and it was kind of a problem. Like, yeah. what are we going to do with this kid? We're so sick of it. As it is, I had two much older sisters, and so they pretty much didn't give me much childhood stuff. They didn't like buy toys very much. I played with my sister's old dolls, and God, this is so psychosexually dangerous. Here. <laughs> um, but so rarely did they. I actually get to go to movies. Occasionally, I get mm -hmm. to go to the drive-in with my dad, yeah, and watch westerns. And I remember mm -hmm. seeing you know John Wayne movies in the drive-in when I was really little, and. A movie experience that I think led to my parents' divorce, or at least among the many factors that did, mm -hmm. they took my dad. I had this obsession for World War II airplanes. I built every World War II airplane model you could possibly find. And the movie Catch 22, the Mike Nichols film, which is 1970, was just in theaters. And Catch 22 was my dad's absolute favorite book. He was a World War II vet. He said that's the only book that ever captured what the war was really like mm. completely insane and awful. And so he took me to see Catch-22 with my mom. And Catch-22 has some pretty dark stuff in it. There's yeah. a scene where uh, I think a naked man gets cut in half by an airplane propeller as it flies overhead and the, the bottom of it falls into the water. And so my mom just like 
shrieked and grabbed me to pull me out of the theater. And I didn't want to leave the theater. And my dad said, oh, let him stay. He loves airplanes. She said, he's leaving the theater right now. And they had this scene in the middle of Catch-22 of, and I was like saying, no, I want to stay. I want to watch the movie. I was like 11. And my mom eventually just like went into the lobby. And I watched the whole thing, including like Snowden's guts falling out. I know. It's pretty heavy for 11. All that stuff. So yeah, movies, movies were always a big thing. I loved them. They destroyed my family life. They were great. <laughs> Well, that's our, that's our yeah, we, we always oh, yes. talk through the movies. Now, um, when did you, what, what made you want to be a writer? Was there any other career path? or? So many people, especially the people you've like talked to, Josh yeah. Olson is a, is a friend, uh, Larry Karaszewski is a friend, they loved movies and always wanted to be doing movies. Uh-huh. And I feel like I don't really deserve to be doing <laughs> movies because I had no intention of that when I was younger. I mean, I always loved movies. They yeah. had a huge effect on me. I used to sneak out and watch like the million dollar movie in New York in the middle of the night. Mm-hmm. My parents were in bed. But I didn't really think that that was something you could do for a living. And, you know, I went to college and I did major in movies. I took like one, one movie course, but it was mostly movies and philosophy because mm-hmm. I was a philosophy major. And after I graduated, pretty much just to get away from the New York area, I drove to California with some friends. And I had no intention of the movie business in Hollywood. I just thought, I've never been to LA. I'll see what happens if I go there. And I couldn't get a job, and I was going door to door for environmental causes. And you know, I finally got like a job on men's magazines. I mean, horrible stuff, anything, because I was totally broke. And after a couple of years of just knocking around and having no idea what to do with my life, uh, this guy that I'd worked with, who was a writer, for men's magazines said, I got a job to write a horror movie, but I don't want to do it by myself. Why don't you write it with me? So you go, okay. I'd never read a screenplay. So I went out and uh, at the time you had to go to like the, the Ampass library mm-hmm. and I read a couple of screenplays <laughs> for movies that I loved. Um, like what? what? Like, Give me an example. Do you remember? I think I read the screenplay for Chinatown and oh, okay. everybody does that yeah, one. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I read the screenplay for actually for Catch Twenty Two. Uh huh. And so I got a sense of you know interior, exterior, all that stuff faded right. on, cut to black. Right. So I got the basic language logic down. Yeah. And then as soon as we started writing this ridiculous horror movie, which was called Grandma's House, <laughs> it was about a really scary grandma. Uh, I knew this is what I this is what I need to be doing, and. It was the only thing. Actually, I wrote a couple of other things with this guy, but then we stopped working together. And I just figured, I can do this for a living. I got paid, I think, $2,000 for that job. That's so not I, bad. It was amazing. It was yeah, like you're a, a paid writer. 1984, 85. Mm-hmm. And it was like, wow, two grand. Yeah. So I was official. And then I kind of, I have looked back many times but and thought, this is a terrible thing to do with your life. But I've kept doing it. Well, you've had uh, great success. Now, how did you... So you, that was a partnership that you felt... Did you fall... Did you feel more comfortable with a partnership? I've written stuff on my own. None of it's mm-hmm. gotten made. And, Interesting. And uh, from the beginning, since movies really are collaborative, I mean, they are yeah. about a whole bunch of people trying to figure out what's mm-hmm. going to work, that it's so much more fun to write with somebody else in the room that you can bounce ideas off of. I mean, mm-hmm. if you get along. It can be awful once you start hating each other. Right. Because that's happened to me, too. <laughs> but while it's good, when it's good, when you're, like, on the same page or when they bring something to it you would never have thought of, there's that sort of discovery process. And it feels like the thing is coming to life, you know, outside of both of you. Right. You know, it's not just me. I mean, I have enough self-loathing in my system that it's kind of more painful working mm-hmm. alone. But working in a room with somebody else is just a lot more relaxing and it becomes a lark instead of a nightmare. Yeah, I could see that. Well, you were telling me before, you know, I always think of a partnership as, you know, Billy Wilder and Charles Brackett. And, and you were telling me you were lucky enough to actually see Billy Wilder. It's, yeah, early in my career, I had, had a couple of experiences like that. I saw in Musso and Frank's, I remember seeing Frank Capra. Oh, like my the God. First time I went to Musso and Frank's in like 1982. Um, but yeah, this is early on. And I, for some reason, had gotten a meeting in a studio in mm-hmm. Columbia at the time. And, there was Billy Wilder walking down the hallway toward me as I was mm-hmm. like leaving my meeting, and he looked 
miserable. <laughs> At the time, he couldn't get arrested. He couldn't get hired for anything. I mean, he never, he was still trying to pitch movies or try to get jobs off the ground, and nobody was hiring him. And I remember thinking, this is so depressing mm -hmm. that Billy Wilder, one of the greatest movie makers of the 20th century, is unemployable now. And I also thought, at the same time, I'm really depressed too, so maybe this business will always make you miserable and maybe that's what's great about it. <laughs> yeah, just think of just think of Billy Wilder. But now they, did you ever have, you said sometimes you, when you don't get along with your partner, and are they creative differences or are they personality differences? Yeah, it's like, know, oh, the way he chooses gum or... There are those things, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> The noises that people make when they move their lips. There are many, many things that can get on a person's nerves and do. Like eventually. I was in a partnership once and, and we were writing something funny and we just didn't think the same things were funny. Oh, that's fatal. And that's, you know, there's nothing worse than people who go, that's not funny. You know, and then you think it's funny. You're like, all right, well, that's, you know, number one, we have to agree on what's funny, you know. Well, I was lucky enough to work with the same writing partner for... I mean, close to 30 years, mm -hmm. and we met in college, and we had the same record collection uh -huh. at the time, and we listened to things <laughs> that nobody else liked, <laughs> and we were big public image fans and, you know, throbbing gristle in bands that people at the time thought were really horrible. Right. Uh, and so that sort of got us on the same page. Yes. And we were both on this college humor magazine, and... and from the our sensibilities meshed pretty well. We we laughed at the same things, mm -hmm. and that's a lot of it. We had really shared a dark sense of humor. Yeah, that that uh, and and what was the magazine? Was it the Harvard Lampoon? Harvard Lampoon, yeah. And uh, that so, what were some of the things you wrote? Uh, like just funny. I'm just curious. I like, was more of a cartoonist. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, that I didn't was know. that was my thing. I wanted uh -huh. to be an artist. When I got out of college, one of the first things I did was going around with a portfolio of cartoons I'd drawn trying to sell them to different magazines in New York City. Uh -huh. And I think I sold like one to the National Lampoon and maybe one to a sailing magazine, which made me a total of about $200. <laughs> and I realized I'm not going to make a living as a cartoonist. <laughs> so then I got a job on a little newspaper in Long Island, mm -hmm. just a weekly newspaper. I was the editor-in-chief. I was the delivery boy. I was a paste-up guy. I did the whole thing for this oh. stupid little newspaper. Yeah. And so from there on, it was like, in some, way, in some ways, writing was less personal to me than drawing. So it was like reporting a story? Yeah, I would sense? cover city council what, meetings. where, when? That stuff. Mm -hmm. um, the best was when there was a murder in town. And this was in, like, 1980 in New York, mm -hmm. in this sort of rundown town on the south shore of the island, Long Beach, New York. And there were always murders. And so I learned really early on, if it bleeds, it leads. Mm -hmm. So put a murder above the fold. And I got to keep some of the newsstand sales, like a portion of the newsstand sales. Right. So I wanted to sell as many papers as possible. Basically, I learned the, the psychology of putting asses in seats mm -hmm. from that. <laughs> um, and so I would always like try to jazz up the stories and you know, double murder in Long Beach. Yeah. Go to crime scenes. And I remember seeing like a... A guy had like pulled a cabbie out of his cab at gunpoint and then run him over repeatedly. Wow. And it was kind of, I have a macabre sense of humor. Yeah. I thought it was kind of great. I got to say, the whole thing was fascinating to me. Lurid. Lurid, yes. Now, what what was your first sort of big break as a, as a film, as a screenwriter? I met Stan Lee. Mm -hmm. And this was in 1984, 85. Mm-hmm. And it was with that original guy who'd asked me to work on the horror movie. And we had a meeting with Stan Lee. I had this agent that I think I just sent something in over the transom to, this woman who was semi-retired mm -hmm. with the memorable name Perry Winkler. And she lived in this horrible little apartment on, on Hawthorne off near Hollywood Boulevard. But she accepted my work from not knowing anybody. And she somehow had a connection to Stan Lee mm -hmm. and had a meeting with Stan Lee. And he was great and funny. And we laughed and talked about where we like to get pizza in New York and basically bonded on a kind of a basic level. And he said, well, you know, how can I exploit you? I'll think of some way to exploit you. How about Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos? And I got hired to write Sergeant Fury and his Howling Commandos. <laughs> Never got made. But... 
I got paid, I think, like $5,000 for that one. Wow. And then there was a deal for Spider-Man at Canon Films. Mm -hmm. And Canon Films, I don't know if you remember. Oh, of course. At the time. Of course. A lot of memorably horrible movies were made at Canon Films. Mm -hmm. And Golan and Globus got hired to write Spider-Man at Canon Films. And thankfully, it never got made there. (laughs) Uh, It would have been awful. But that was kind of it. Then it was like, oh, that's almost A list. Yeah. It's kind of like A minus or B plus list, but it was writing movies. And, you know, I also I was in the Writers Guild all mm-hmm. of a sudden. And and who are some of the people? So when you're going to the Writers Guild, like, who are, are you asking for advice to? Essentially, you become a member of the Writers Guild automatically if you're hired by a signatory company, mm-hmm. as I was. And, like, the first getting to know you orientation meeting at the Writers Guild um, was one of the writers of Casablanca was there and Gene Roddenberry oh got up and talked and I got to meet him and it was really kind of great these sort yeah. of heroes of my childhood um, then I never saw anybody there again I'd like never said from the building <laughs> for like 25 years but it was a pretty great introduction to things I always feel like that some, something like that stays with you. I, many, many years ago, I was in a, I, I accept, when I was in acting school, I accepted, uh, my grandfather was put into the Theater Hall of Fame, and that year, it was insane. It was like Robert Preston and Ruth Gordon and Robert White had the producer, and Edward Albee. <laughs> I come sitting, and so I was like, oh, I'm doing Edward Albee scenes and you know they're i'm watching them in acting school and so even if you just for me just seeing someone like that was enough to kind of inspire you that you can move ahead mm-hmm. do you know what i mean it I makes it feel you, real yeah and that you're real on some level that you yeah. weren't before you're like so, he wrote casablanca and i'm in the same room and okay it may be a golden globe and stanley movie but still it one day i'll write casablanca there you go. Yeah, yeah, you feel like all of a sudden you're you're on some level part of the possibility of the club, if yeah. not actually in the club. I think that's true. I think that's what's so great about you know writing movies. There's always this possibility of you know a big a big hit. Um, now I want to make sure that we talk about some of your movies. Let's talk about the net, which is a movie I love, and I feel as if it would be really they should re-release that film. I love. Uh, the female protagonist in mm-hmm. the thriller, and you don't see it that much. And I love, I said at the top of the show, I love thrillers. Like when I grew up, and you talked about movies you saw with your dad, my father loved uh, thrillers. Mm-hmm. Like, it, and so those were, if there was a thriller on TV, you know, Three Days of the Condor, Power Alex Vito, I was like, oh, okay, that's a movie dad's going to like. And then we all, so I, I, you know, I really ended up liking them and so but you don't see too many thrillers with a female uh protagonist and of course i love the theme of the paranoia i feel like every woman feels that Mm -hmm. they've wiped out who i am no one believes me so talk about how you got the uh, the idea for the net that's a strange one uh i'd written the game before i wrote the net Uh as a spec script uh back in 91 Mm -hmm. and it wasn't getting made in fact, it got put into turnaround, but it got me meetings with a lot of producers. Mm-hmm. And I had a meeting with Erwin Winkler where he was approaching myself and my writing partner to do a remake of The Mechanic. Mm-hmm. At least that's what I prepared for. Got into the room with the guy and he said, I want to do something about resume tampering. It's like, that I haven't thought about that. A resume tampering movie? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? He said, oh, there's this article, this great article about people in Japan who hire people to make their background better. It's like, okay, I guess that could be a movie. It was like a meeting. I felt like, oh, this was worthless. This was a totally horrible meeting. <laughs> and I laughed, and I remember like at some point my keys fell out of my pocket, and I had to go back and get my keys, which were in his couch. And oh. It was like, the worst kind of meeting. Right. And then I, once I got home, I got a phone call. Oh, they want to hire you for the resume movie. It's like, okay. <laughs> the resume movie, I don't know what that is really, but okay. And I wound up writing a draft with my partner of this resume tampering movies, which, which was terrible. It was terrible. I mean, we'd worked out the whole story with in meetings with Erwin and his producing people, and, and it was just it just didn't work. Mm-hmm. And I think everybody realized that. I handed in the dutiful draft. And then I was thinking about the whole world of resumes and identity, 
And identity theft was a novel idea mm. back at the time in 1992 or three. Right. And I remember I got my I got an account in America Online to sort of explore this world of things, which was a novelty then too. And then I thought, well, the most obvious thing in the world is the way to do this: literally have somebody's identity stolen. And then, without really telling them, our second draft of the resume tampering movie was a completely different screenplay. Just this is better. They'll mm. understand that it's better. They'll understand this works and the other one didn't. Right. I mean, I remember my writing partner was kind of terrified of it because it's it was risky. Um, but at the same, as soon as they got it, they said, "Oh no, this is a movie," and that. Partially, they wanted something that felt a little like the game. They wanted mm -hmm. something that was paranoia-inducing. Um, and there's an element that David Fincher later got really mad at me for, because the net came out before he made the game, mm -hmm. of waking up in a foreign country. Right. You know, that you're in a foreign country and you can't, don't know how to get home. And that same beat is in both movies, mm. which was a little cheesy, I'll admit, to steal from yourself that way. But... They well, they did beat. it. You did, uh, did, yeah, Howard Hawks did it, so he could <laughs> he true. could keep remaking the same yeah, movie. Yeah, so Rio could you. Bravo, and yeah. <laughs> uh, so that was kind of the origin of it, mm -hmm. and I immediately liked the idea of a female protagonist for it, even though you know women didn't open movies. I mean, that was always the logic of it, and mm -hmm. you know this new Sandra Bullock person who was who hadn't come out yet in Speed. Mm -hmm. It was all pretty risky from the, the studio point of view, mm -hmm. and so turned in a draft and they really liked it and as I was working on another draft um, they decided to generate a draft of their own in-house Erwin Winkler and some of his producing people which I didn't know about uh -huh. and then I got turned in my second draft and got fired basically the first half of that movie is as I would imagined it should be right and the last half where she's just running the whole time yeah. was their work <laughs> right you just get used to being rewritten and getting blamed for things that you had nothing to do with oh. as a writer. There's a lot of that. And so I, I like the beginning of the movie, and I think Sandra Bullock's great. And she was really sweet and liked yeah. working with her to the extent I did. I got to go to the set once. <laughs> the first half. The first half of the yes. movie. Now, with all this stuff in the news, with you know Russia and identity and Facebook, and does it, does it uh, percolate ideas? I mean, what about this girl? I mean, are a hundred people writing a movie about the girl who's the Russian spy? Absolutely. I, I mean, mean I that like is ripe. 34 Paul Manafort <laughs> projects in development right now. <laughs> Miniseries, features, you name it. I got approached on one. Um, yeah, I think all that stuff is very much out there. And people thought the net was ahead of its time, which is kind of hilarious. Because it, it felt to me... It was. Okay, I'm just going to indulge in a writerly thing and talk about the way it should have ended. Yes, please. Which do it. didn't end with a, like a fire extinguisher hitting some guy over the head on a catwalk. Right. Which I had, I had nothing to do with. <laughs> uh, in the draft that I handed in with my writing partner, it ends with essentially mutually assured destruction that she will take down the entire apparatus of these dark, awful people. All she wants is her life back. Mm -hmm. And so she doesn't actually win but she just gets to a place where she won't be destroyed, but mm -hmm. is still living in kind of a conversation-like paranoid moment at the end. Right. And they all thought, oh, that's just too dark. I said, but nobody really wins against the internet. Yeah. As, you're now, as, you're now, as you're now seeing. Um, and then, so then let's talk about the game, which is other, um, a script, you know, oftentimes as, as an actress, you would read scripts and they're hard to read, but I remember reading the game uh, you know, early on, thinking, "Oh, I want to be in this movie so bad." Uh, it was, and David Fincher is such a technical great uh, director. And so, talk about the, you know, it, the, so it, it got resurrected. Yeah, after it's the, the story of them, I mean, the origin of that movie. Um, I was, I did a couple of Roger Corman pictures. I did some low budget airplane movies. Mm -hmm. I was in this rut of doing kind of crap movies, mm -hmm. and. I was feeling like this is, I was 30, 31, thereabouts, feeling like this is not a life. This is not a grown-up life. I don't want to live this life. Mm -hmm. I don't want to just be a B-movie complete hack. And, you know, that was sort of where I was. I was writing all the spec screenplays I'd done weren't getting made, mm -hmm. and I didn't really like them that much. And I was kind of spiraling down into a serious depression. And I remember I had a, a new puppy that was like crapping all over the rug, and 
It was a really hot day and a house with no air conditioning. And I was just about as depressed as I could be and entertaining suicidal thoughts. I thought, well, what will it take to get me out of this deep funk, this deep existential despair? Mm -hmm. And the idea for the game hit me, honestly, like a thunderbolt. The movie Beginning to End kind of popped into my head mm -hmm. that I would need a company to devote incredible resources to turn my head around, to pull out the rug under from under my life mm -hmm. and prove to me what's real and what counts as opposed to this crap that I'm drowning in. Right. And that was the the movie. And I just, I had this, it felt like, oh my God, I have been, I have been hit with the thunderbolt. Yeah. I have been blessed. It comes from the muses, <laughs> you know, all the metaphors for things that come from somewhere other than your yeah. own messed up psyche, which it was a product of. Uh, and that, I called my writing partner, and I said, I have this idea for a movie. I'm going to write it. You can write it with me. I'd like it if you write it with me. It'd be more fun to write. Mm -hmm. Here it is. And what always amused me is, like people often said after the movie came out, it was great except for that stupid tacked-on Hollywood ending where he like jumps off the building and lands in a cushion. So that was there from the first five minutes of, of the idea. You know, It was all to build up to somebody who is the worst part of his life and wants to kill himself right. to ecstasy out of like the best party he's ever been to mm -hmm. that if I could put those two moments right next to each other yeah I've done something and that was what the movie was for was to get to that moment of, of revelation the uh, well it's I I love the movie and so how what was your experience like working with David Fincher aside from you said he got mad at you for writing the other well he wasn't thing. attached to it originally uh-huh it was a spec script and I I kind of told myself if this doesn't sell um, then I really don't belong in Hollywood anyway. And mm -hmm. it's great. I can stop doing this. I can go to graduate school. I can do something else with my life. Um, but it sold. Mm -hmm. And it sold to MGM at the time. And I had meetings with Alan Ladd Jr. And they were all kind of excited about it. And then all of a sudden, they weren't very excited about it. And I heard from my agent, oh, by the way, they put it to turnaround. It's like after doing 12 drafts. Wow. Like, okay. Then it kind of languished. And it got picked up at a turnaround, and there was a director attached to it. Uh, Jonathan Mostow mm -hmm. was attached to it to direct, and he had a sort of a different vision for it. And I kept rewriting it and rewriting, and it got taken to propaganda films. And then I rewrote it about another 12 times and took it in all kinds of different directions. And it sort of stopped being anything I loved anymore. I mean, eventually they, they managed to destroy your babies right and then Mostow got sort of bought off the project and David Fincher who was a client of propaganda mm -hmm. or the management company end of it really loved the script mm -hmm. and he came onto it and I didn't even know about this he got another writer to rework it for himself and that didn't work that draft so eventually I get the phone call oh Fincher wants to meet with you great and we go back and he's working from the first draft he like all the bazillion drafts that sort of took it in different directions right he sort of threw out the window and said well your first draft really had something mm -hmm. um let's work it through and it was kind of great working with because he's the only probably the only time this ever happened to me in hollywood fincher said can't we make the character less likable <laughs> you know can't we just let's let's make him into more of a prick right the beginning Right. Then the whole thing will work better, which was absolutely right. I had done all these versions where let's let's you know have pet the dog moments. Mm -hmm. Let's make him lovable. Mm -hmm. We can't have a movie with somebody who's so repellent at the center. Who's, for one thing, we can't have a movie with a guy who's thinking about killing himself at the beginning, mm -hmm. because that's just alienate. You know, you get all these awful notes, and you're kind of under, they have you over a barrel. You try not to do them, and then they say, "What about that note?" Do you? Mm -hmm. And you're trying to keep your job. Right. And you try not to get fired. You get fired anyway. But it was great because Fincher did a draft, a couple of drafts with him, brought it back to pretty much what it should be, mm -hmm. and then got fired anyway <laughs> at the last <laughs> minute. Oh, no. Because I had an argument with him over some things in it. You just, you don't argue with the director. Really? Especially when it's David Fincher. Just about plot things or character things. It What's a, more it was, important? It was a plot, plot thing. Plot, yeah. I find plot to be really challenging. Uh, you know, just as a, you know, in, as you're watching a movie, that's the hard. In a thriller, mm -hmm. isn't plot like everything? 
Yeah, it really, well, that kind of thriller, so much of it is. It really is. I mean, the character stuff really worked. We got pretty lucky, I think, with, even with, like, Sean Penn's little part. Yeah. Which was originally supposed to be Jodie Foster, or not originally. At one point, the part was for Jodie Foster and had to be rewritten for a woman, but Jodie yeah. Foster didn't know if she was going to be, she wanted to be his, Michael Douglas's daughter. Michael Douglas wanted her to be his sister. <laughs> <laughs> and so, as an actress, I'm sure you you know how actors can get about things like this. And yes, oh, not me. I take whatever. <laughs> I answer the phone and, and so say yes. Actually had, they had like they had to pay off Jodie Foster to go away. They said, well, okay, we'll go with Michael Douglas, and then they hired Sean Penn uh-huh. to play the part that she was going to play. Oh, interesting. Now, do you have you know when you do you have any conspiracy theories yourself aside from if you write if you start writing movies that are about conspiracies, then doesn't everything seem like a conspiracy? You know? Wouldn't it be nice to think so? <laughs> Wouldn't it be nice to think there's somebody who's got a plan? Well, what I kind of think there isn't. I think it's really just people bumping around in the dark. And making a horrible mess. Really, you don't go back. Every time I start looking, I'm like, "Well, there's JFK and there's Marilyn, and the, you know, it seems like there's, you know, America is based on one big conspiracy. Oh, people do awful things. Like yeah, that. going back to the 1800s. Absolutely. You know, I mean, from putting you know smallpox on blankets. Yeah, I mean, people people are awful. Yeah, I would never ever argue that point. But I also think they're kind of stupid. Yeah, and that's can be a salvation at the moment in America. It doesn't look like salvation. It looks like it will destroy us. But I hope not. stupidity protects a lot of us. Yeah, well, it's it's good to uh, it's good to be that way. But that uh, whole Henry Fonda, you know, grapes of wrath I, 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 idea that used to come from the movies. Do you ever try to put any kind of message? You mentioned seeing Frank Capra. Is that is that gone from a? Uh, you know, when I think of traditionally watching movies and growing up. You know, Capra and mm-hmm. Capricorn. And I always thought a writer's job, Patty Chayefsky was a person who had a great influence on, on me. I always thought a writer's job was to secretly infiltrate some sort of message. And has that gone away? Is the writer merely now a technician? I don't think so. In my writing, in a lot of things I've worked on, I absolutely had a reason to be doing it. Mm-hmm. There was something I wanted to communicate. And I think the thing that makes movies work, good movies, mm-hmm. and I always look for is, does this thing have a reason to exist? Right. I mean, even in a, a job that I was hired for, like the Terminator Terminator 3, mm-hmm. I had a thing I wanted to get there. I thought it was a kind of an awful idea to go back to Terminator without James Cameron, and I thought the world will hate us, and all kinds of things looked like this could really be bad. Right. But when I had the, the idea that it, if we actually take this back to the first movie right, and actually like drop the bombs mm-hmm. in the last five minutes of the movie, then the movie has a reason to exist. Mm-hmm. And it's about something. And it's also maybe gets people's stomach flipping a little bit in a way that it wouldn't right. about the fact that maybe some kinds of fate aren't fixable. Mm-hmm. So, okay, that's not exactly a message like a network, but it was... To some degree, I hope what I do at least flips people's heads a little bit. Mm-hmm. I think almost everything I've worked on tries to do that. I mean, the game, the net, even the two Terminator films I worked on. Um, Catwoman less so, but that's a whole other story. <laughs> that, yeah, you hope that there's something that will get people to challenge their own preconceptions Yeah. in the movie. And a movie can do that. A movie can really... And I remember as a kid, the movies that were the best were the ones that you go, hmm. Yeah. I always think like a question mark exclamation point appears over your head, right? That moment of, what's going on? Yeah. That you can get to. And I, and I think almost everything I've worked on tries to mm-hmm. produce that. Yeah, I always thought it was an interesting idea to get us, get, I know it's laughable considering it's Hollywood, but we get a certain morality from watching these these films mm-hmm. and these images and they, you know, they really, they, you know, they kind of stay with you. Now, when you st- were talking briefly about the, the Terminator movies, like what, what do you have to do when you're going into a genre film? Obviously you have to protect the identity, you know, of the Terminator. Are there any taboos? Like they go, well, first of all, no, he's not going to smoke a cigarette or, really, you know, I don't know. You What rules? That stuff came up. Really? Well, like in, in the <laughs> meeting Arnold, Arnold had a very good sense of what 
he could and wouldn't do as a right. Terminator. Arnold doesn't do this. I, I would not do that. I love it. And yeah, it was it was really kind of it was kind of great meeting with him. It was really fun actually. And he just had a very clear sense of what was right for the character. Yeah. And I think we probably all kind of do if you've seen those movies and you like those movies. Yeah. You have a sense of what works and what's real and what, what would be right in a Terminator movie and what wouldn't. Right. You know, so to some extent, those are those were fan fiction since we weren't the original creators of the series or anything. Right. But yeah, I think we all of us participate in the world that these movies make up. You know, we're all we all know what Batman should and shouldn't do. Right. And when something goes wrong in one of those movies, you go, oh, yeah, boy, they blew it. They kind of... Like, they can't trip. They jumped the shark there. They can't, you know... <laughs> can't. Right. You don't want to see the Terminator fall flat on his face. <laughs> you don't want to see the Terminator in the toilet. There are a lot of things... Oh, unless he's having a fight there, which we threw in. Yeah. Um, you know, it's they're pretty obvious. But you could also have fun with the... Uh, the or or, or uh, have a romance. It's very hard for the Terminator to have a romance. Absolutely. And exactly how many parts does he have? I mean, there are all these, like, questions <laughs> that came up that we didn't address. Well, they tackled that in The Shape of Water, you know, didn't they? Yes, they did. Very interesting. Uh, the Do you ever watch other movies for inspiration? Like, if you're stuck... On a script, like you go, I'm I'm just stuck, and then you, what sort of movies do you do you watch? Uh, yeah. My favorite films and the things that I'll go back to again and again that I've seen so many times I can almost recite them. The things like the Philadelphia Story, mm -hmm. which still one of my absolute top films. Um, I could watch Badlands again and again and learn from that. Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah. You know these handful of movies that really were huge in my life. I will look at when. The whole business just feels really awful, mm -hmm. and to remind you why you sort of wanted to do it in the first place and how good it can be. But a lot of it is, yeah, I you bang your head against the wall when you're writing a script. You're just going to. There's going to be usually around page thirty, mm -hmm. and then again around page sixty-five, seventy. Yeah. There'll be a part where you think, "Why did I even start this? I have no idea what this is. This is just falling apart." Right. No matter how much you outline it in the at the beginning, mm -hmm. there will come times when it just doesn't feel like it's going to work, mm -hmm. and you kind of just have to bang your head until it, something cracks and right. It's it like you've pours you've, out, you know. It's like you've invited all these characters on a road trip, and then now you're stuck at a gas station in you know Arizona or something, and you got to get I them know. home. I always find I'm good at endings and beginnings. But I'm like, I, I'm when you said the page sixty five, that's sort of how I am. I'm like, damn it, I gotta get them home to this place, mm -hmm. and then that's when I usually just take a break and watch tons of movies, and then. Uh, but yeah, you pro you probably have screenplays that you started and you get to like page thirty and then just say, oh, this is just not gonna. Happen. I I always always wanted to work with partners and it never really worked out. Um, and I was always disappointed about that. I always felt that I was doing the lion's share of the work and that maybe we were, that I was really good at dialogue and I mm -hmm. wanted someone who was better at plot. I, I have no interest in plot and it's, you, and in order to be a writer, you have to, ha you, you really have to hone that skill. Yeah. And I feel lazy, like, I just want to write fun dialogue and put them in, you know, because I have this 1940s idea of what writing is like, you mm -hmm. know. It's like I'll be the pacer and I'll come up with stuff and you'll sit and do all the grammar and all the spelling. And Structure everything. is so much of what they are. It really, really, really know. is. You know, There's no way around it. Yeah, but it's fun to learn. You know, one of the great things about writing is you know, I'm lear sort of learning how to write is that you do get better. You know, like, Absolutely. like with everything, it's I, th I think I had an idea of like, well, some people really are, I think, born writers. You think of the Mankiewiczes and stuff. Boy, it just seems like they were born, you know, mm -hmm. they seem to all be born with pens in their hands. But like you said, if it's a craft and sometimes if you just have to turn something in, you, you probably, you know. Yeah, I mean, for me, from the beginning and working on movies, um, what really interested me is why it was there. You know, mm -hmm. I majored in philosophy. I'm always sort of trying to get to a meta level and take it apart and figure out why does this exist? Yeah. What does this do in the world? You know, what is it saying? I mean, I don't know about messages like call Western Union kind of messages, but this will, if it gets made, mm -hmm. be a thing. Yeah. And what is it as a thing? Is it telling people exactly what about the world and how they should live? Because movies are moral pointers. You know, they really are. They're, besides just being distractions, 
They're selling value systems. They're selling a worldview. They're selling mm -hmm. how the world should be or could be or aren't we sorry that it is this way? And there's so much that they're always doing. Mm -hmm. So I try, try to sort of think about movies as that. Um, do you have a favorite scene that you've written that you that that you just feel like oh I nailed it in that scene? The rooftop in the game uh -huh. is my, still my favorite scene. The reversals that happen there, you know, this guy who's completely convinced right. that it's all been a scam to take all his money, and then is being told the truth and doesn't believe it's the truth, mm -hmm. and just seems like it's more of the scam, and then acts on it in a violent way, and then makes the biggest mistake of his life. I, I mean the dynamics of that scene and the mm -hmm. series of reversals that occur in the space of like five minutes right. of screen time, that was that was something I was pretty proud of. Mm -hmm. And I was up on the rooftop when they were shooting that scene and it was like, it was so great. It was so great because Fincher, for example, is making Michael Douglas do take after take after take to get him to a more extreme psychological place. Mm -hmm. You know, so as an actress, I would think you may not might not want to work with David Fincher. He can be pretty hard on his casts. Yeah. Well, they're all different. You know what I mean? It's you know. But it was it that was great, and I feel really proud of that. I liked the ending of Terminator Three. I liked the revelation that all the bombs are falling. Mm -hmm. You know, and that everything that you thought you were doing to for this movie, mm -mm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> nope. It's just to take it back to where we were in the first movie. Did you ever want to do sort of comedy thrillers like, you know, Dr. Strangelove in that vein? I've written them and they haven't gotten made. Oh, can you t say what a couple of them are without, you know, oh, I like wrote... what's the great, you know, you what's your what are what's in your closet that you want to see get done? Oh, I wrote this movie called Remote Control, which was such a st I knew from the beginning this is like the stupidest idea I've ever had. This is 25 <laughs> years ago. But I think that's what's so great about it. Uh -huh. So it was the notion is that here's this remote, somebody is traveling from the future. Again, it was sort of a Terminator-like premise. Mm -hmm. A time traveler is going back because this person, this sort of hustler guy, inadvertently mm -hmm. is setting into motion the destruction of everything. He doesn't know it. In fact, he's, he's just selling a toy that sort of vomits green stuff. It's mm -hmm. like a baby doll that vomits green stuff. But in the future this green stuff will take over the entire planet, and there'll just be these rivers, these glaciers of green plastic sort of swooping all over the planet and eating everything. So this guy goes back in time with a remote control device that can shoot through time, it can re rewind, it can fast forward, it can pause, it can do all those tricks. And it was a fun parody of a time travel movie. Because mm -hmm. I've been hired to write a bunch of time travel movies over the years, many of which haven't gotten made or got made in different forms. I love time travel movies. Oh, they're great. Especially if it's anything to do with Jack the Ripper, number one. <laughs> yes. You have to get in Jack the Ripper or John F. Kennedy. Yeah. <laughs> I remember when I first saw The Terminator, like in the park, like walking to the car in the parking lot, this back in 1984, I thought, really, if you had that kind of time travel machine, wouldn't you go back to like 33 AD? Wouldn't you go back to Jesus? Really? And wouldn't you, if you could, get some of his semen? <laughs> and wouldn't you, if you could, then impregnate a race of demigods in the present day? You know, nuns are already married to Christ, right? So right. impregnate a whole bunch of nuns with Jesus stuff, and they're legal babies. They're okay, legitimate. this already, this sounds like the great plot of a new Netflix series. <laughs> well, I wrote this as an animated, <laughs> an animated series on, for the internet, 12 years ago, uh -huh. and everybody was too scared to do it. They said, well, we'll be firebombed. It was this outfit <laughs> called Icebox.com, uh -huh. which was doing little funny animation things. Yeah. And actually, we got as far as the animatics on it. We did the recording session. It was great. Because, you know, Lazarus is a flesh-eating zombie, and yes. this really hot nun travels back in time to get Jesus's jizz, <laughs> and she's got, like, this special AccuJack thing that'll... Anyway... Okay. <laughs> it was called Spunk of the Lord, and I, I, I love loved it. it. It's one of my favorite ideas. Yeah. That never got made. Well, you never know. You you pitched it very successfully. Okay, I want to talk. We don't have much time left, so so let's talk about the last uh, Neanderthal, your uh, current project. This is fun. I, I was approached by. Um, I've always been really fascinated by human origins and like a lot of people, yeah. and all the recent research about Neanderthal DNA being in our DNA and what have you ever, they were like. Have you ever met, I hate to interrupt you, but I, I, have you ever uh, 
been around chimpanzees. I have. It's life changing, right? It's really, really weird. It's like oh, it's like the, flying monkeys. It's like they're oh yes. <laughs> yeah. I was like, it's their us. So anyway, I have. I'm, they really I'm, are. I'm with you. It's like, or it's everyone in their life should should be really close to a chimpanzee because it's like, oh, there, I'm a chimpanzee. <laughs> and the things about Neanderthals, because like the, all the yeah. images of cavemen and you know Geico ads and stuff, right? That Neanderthals had bigger brains than we did, and the only reason I think that they didn't last is they had a very different social structure. Mm-hmm. They had small groups. There were only like ten or twelve in a group. And then these new fangled humans come out of Africa, and there's like 50 or 70 or 100 of them mm-hmm. with a very different social structure. I mean, Neanderthals were more independent. Right. They had their own way of living that really worked. Mm-hmm. But they couldn't sustain the, the onslaught of a new species of monkey, us, that came out of Africa and took over. So a story about that, about you know Neanderthal who is the last of his kind or pretty much the last of his kind right. and what that's like mm-hmm. and to try to communicate otherness I mean I love things that succeed at that you know like right. Man Who Fell to Earth kinds of movies that sort of show a very different mind or try mm-hmm. to show a different mind obviously we're limited by the fact that our minds aren't going to be smarter than they already are Right. but you really try to just get across a very di- different kind of story about 40,000 years ago and that's what this is going to I hope come to be now who was it they say what's the difference between a caveman and a neanderthal was a cave you know when you have the uh, the caveman uh hit the woman on the head dragged her dragged her off is that the caveman yeah people think those are neanderthals that they're cavemen because they have you know the big brow ridge and the right big teeth and all that and neanderthals the only reason that we call them cavemen is Mm because they find the remains in caves because that preserves them okay neanderthals lived in huts neanderthals lived in structures right they, they lived all over the place in different ways mm-hmm. but they're seen as cavemen just because you know especially when it was really cold in the ice age a cave was a pretty good place to go right and, hide. and that's where their corpses were found so yeah you can call them cavemen what were the what are the neanderthal women doing around the the are they this is one of the greatest things about this and this is like based on recent research and that mm-hmm. people there's so much anthropomorphism stuff going on or actually the anthropocentrism where people think human beings homo sapiens are just better we're just better in the same way that <laughs> not me you know, white people used to think they were better than everybody else or men think they're better than women and the same thing is the speciesism of homo sapiens thinking they're better than neanderthal right right in fact neanderthal society was much more from the looks of it egalitarian mm-hmm. it looks like the women hunted alongside men mm-hmm. And that the sort of division of labor, which distinguishes our species, right. you know, where people are like slotted into different jobs, happened pretty early on because we were in much larger groups. Right. But in a small group, everybody chips in and they're all working together. And that's kind of the Neanderthal structure and model. Mm-hmm. You know, and they cared for their sick and elderly and, you know, they... Sounds had... like chimpanzees. Again, chimpanzees are in small groups yeah. and sometimes they... You know, they can't get along and they have to be integrated and uh, sometimes you know what I love in the chimp world is like there'll be like a, a rogue female chimp and she mates with all the men and you know there are all these archetypes that are in human beings mm-hmm. you can find in the chimpanzee world it's incredible like you said the elder they take care of the their elders they're you know and the women were strong and muscular and powerful almost yeah. as much so as the men and yeah. Part of it is, you know, the center of this is like a very egalitarian relationship between, you know, the a male and female Neanderthal. So it's oh, it sounds it's great. It's a really different way of looking at, you know, banging yeah. people over the head and dragging them around by the hair. And where where will we be able to see this? Oh, let's see. It's a uh, uh, Terry Notary who did you see a movie called The Square? Oh my God, I love The Square. Yeah, Terry Notary's the monkey in The Square. Okay, everyone's got to see the square. That is one of the most disturbing, funny. Isn't I love it? the square. Swedish, right? Yeah. Swed- Swedish uh, film. Uh, Norwegian is it? or Swedish? Or Norwegian. Yeah. Incredible film, the square. Oh my God, that scene is real. Isn't it? Yes. It just really messes with you. Go to Terry, your internets right now. Look up the square. Terry was uh, started, I think, in Cirque du Soleil and a, a movement yeah. guy, and just incredible body control yes and he basically teaches everybody in all the planet of the apes films to be monkeys oh and he'll just he'll immediately he'll lapse into here i'm a chimpanzee right and he'll be a chimpanzee and 
nail it. And, oh, you want to see an orangutan? You want to see a gorilla? Oh, and he just does them perfectly, <laughs> like, like that. And it's kind of fascinating. He had the original idea of, let's do a movie about yeah. early man, because that's sort of been his, his world. Yeah. And you know, we met, and we just hit it off. He could be the bridge. I mean, if he's really that close, you know. Yeah. He's, um, he's really great. So if, he's out to direct it. So I, oh. it should be really fun. All righty. Well, good luck with that. Well, John, thank you so much. It's been an absolute blast. This is a treat. It really is. Thank you for, oh, for goodness. Come talking back to me. Anytime. I'm going to, it makes me, now I want to go back and watch the game. I'm definitely exactly. sick. Yeah, so I can, me too. I can see that rooftop scene. Yeah. yeah. And you thought you were going to have nothing to say, John. I could babble for hours, I guess. <laughs> Thank you so much. So for look, Thank look you. forward to The Last Neanderthal when it comes out and revisit The Game and The Net and all the other movies that John has done. Thank you, John. But not Catwoman. And, but not Catwoman. <laughs> Uh, and you can buy Ileana's book, I Blame Dennis Hopper, on Amazon and at bookstores if there are bookstores where you are. Uh, also, you can like our Facebook page. Yes, like us on Facebook. And the website is ilianaspodcast.com. That's right. And as I always say, everyone's life is like a movie, and you're the star of your own movie. And uh, it's got a beginning, a middle, and an end. So have a, have a great life. Everyone, and thanks for uh, listening in. Kevin Undergaro, Phil Svitek, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network. We would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit popcorntalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network. The views expressed herein are those of the hosts only and do not necessarily reflect the views of AfterBuzz TV or its owners or principals.